Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Janie Gordon, and I'm the program administrator of the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center. On behalf of the Training Center and the Center for Sexually Transmitted Infection Prevention at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's presentation of the Sexual and Reproductive Health Grand Round Series on Sex and the Superbug, Next Steps in Dealing with Multi-Drug Resistant Gonorrhea in Maryland. Before I turn the program over to Barbara Conrad, who is the Chief of the Center for Sexually Transmitted Infection Prevention, I wanna make a few announcements. For people who are watching online, please check out our, our, our archive Grand Rounds and other online trainings. And I'd also like to draw your attention to some of our live face-to-face -face trainings that are coming up, including logic modeling and community assessment. Our next regular public health practice grand rounds is on October 17th and will be about making health reform happen, how Maryland is implementing the Affordable Care Act. Also, for those watching online, Please know that you can email a question for either or both of today's presenters by simply clicking on the link. We also ask that you fill in the sign-in form so that we can give our federal funders a better idea of who is watching and how many people are watching today's webcast. We also ask everyone in the live audience to complete the um, HRSA form, I believe it's green today, at the sign-in table, and also to please sign in. With that, I'm gonna hand the program over to Barbara Conrad. And one additional con comment, the webcast archive will be available on our website in seven to 14 days. Thank you. Thanks, Janie. And welcome to everyone for joining in with this webinar today. As we all know, gonorrhea, if it's left untreated, can have serious health effects. But treatment is getting more challenging, as we will hear today. So our speakers today will talk about the development of antibiotic resistance in gonorrhea, the con current status of resistance globally, nationally, and here in Maryland, and recommendations on what state and local health departments and clinicians can do to strengthen, strengthen gonorrhea control efforts. And today we will have as speakers both a clinician and a laboratorian. First up will be Dr. Khalil Ghanem. He is an associate professor of medicine in the Infectious Diseases Division at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and has a joint appo appointment in Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Ghanem is also the director of STD, HIV, and TB clinical services at the Baltimore City Health Department. Jo Dr. Jafar Razek has been the chief of public health microbiology at the Laboratories Administration of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene since 2009. His lab is one of a small number of public health laboratories in the country still performing gonorrhea culture and sensitivity testing. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Ghanem. Thank you so much, Barbara. It's a pleasure to be here. The first slide I'm gonna show you is a reminder for me to tell you that go ahead and email your questions to the presenters at any time during the session. So feel free to email starting from now uh, and throughout the session. This is the email address there. You can also click on it on the link that you have and we will show the slide again at the end of the talk. Please remember if you're not watching us live, don't email us because we won't be around to take your questions. So the first part, we're gonna essentially go over briefly the epidemiology of gonorrhea in the US and locally, but very briefly. And then I'd like to spend a lot more time talking about the issue of managing gonorrhea today. I have no relevant financial disclosures. So starting off with the epidemiology of gonorrhea, as you can see, there was a peak in the incidence of gonorrhea in the mid 70s. And after a concerted public health effort, the rates declined precipitously. And starting in the mid 90s, the rates stabilized with slight increases and decreases uh, each and every year, but for the most part, a fairly stable rate since the mid 90s. Um, as many of you know, gonorrhea tends to occur mainly in the southeastern part of the United States, but also in high-density areas, big cities, um, and 
there tends to be uh, a higher uh, incidence of gonorrhea among um, the African uh, American uh, population uh, that is uh, much higher than other races, but that um, th that discrepancy has actually been um, uh, has been improving over the last several years. Uh, this slide stops at about 2008. Over the last several years, um, the difference has actually um, uh, shrunk, but it's still significant. Uh, Algonoria also uh, tends to affect, as most STDs uh, do, uh, the younger age group. And this is no different uh, nationally as locally. Just a few words on the local epidemiology, and I'll just remind you that these slides are all available on the CDC website as well as the DHMH website for the local slide. So you can feel free to look over them uh, at a slower pace if you like. Locally in Maryland between 2007 and 2011, again, uh, the rates have been fairly stable with the counties having lower rates uh, than the city, of course. And overall, the Maryland rates have been slightly higher than the national average. Uh, similarly in Maryland, uh, rates in men and women are are about the same. Again, the city residents have a much higher uh, incidence rate than the county residents. And again, finally, in Maryland, the, the age group, it's younger age group in general that tend to be affected by GC mainly. And so this is a slide that I think is very important. And I would like to sort of turn your attention to the first three, um, the, the first three, um, uh, the first part of the graph, where we have essentially gonorrhea, both urethral, rectal, and pharyngeal. And I want to remind you that gonorrhea, just like most other STIs, tends to be asymptomatic. If you look at the rectal gonorrhea and the pharyngeal gonorrhea, up to 90% of cases may be asymptomatic. Symptomatic. As such, if you ask about symptoms, you are going to miss the vast majority of cases of gonorrhea. You're going to miss the vast majority of cases of chlamydia. So rather than asking about symptoms, you really should be asking about exposures. If somebody is exposed, then you should probably go ahead and test them. Again, don't ask about symptoms, ask about exposures. Now, who do we screen for gonorrhea, and what are the recommendations? There is targeted screening that's recommended for high-risk women, and these high-risk women are women who had a previous gonorrhea infection, had a history of other sexually transmitted infection, new or multiple sex partners, inconsistent condom use, commercial sex work, drug use, or they're coming from an area of high prevalence. Screening is recommended in pregnant women at the first prenatal visit if the woman, again, has certain high-risk factors that I just stated. Those who have continued risk, the first screening should occur at the first prenatal visit. Those who have continued risk during pregnancy should also be screened a second time during the third trimester. I also want to highlight an important point here. The CDC now recommends that anybody who gets diagnosed with gonorrhea, or for that matter, chlamydia, if they get diagnosed and treated, you should repeat screening or repeat testing in three months. You want to retest them in three months, mainly because the reinfection rates for both of these infections are very high. So if somebody gets diagnosed and treated for gonorrhea, you want to go back in three months and rescreen or retest them to make sure that they were not reinfected. As for men, the USPSTF found insufficient evidence to recommend for or against routine screening for gonorrhea infection in men who are at increased risk for infection, but that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't screen. There just aren't strong data to recommend one way or the other. The CDC does recommend annual gonorrhea screening for all sexually active MSM by testing the exposed site. So if some, an MSM patient comes in and they've been exposed in the genital area, test them at the genital area. If they've been exposed rectally, test them rectally. And if they've been exposed orally, go ahead and test them in the, uh, the pharyngeal area. And also remember that repeat testing for all patients, whether woman or man, you have to repeat testing in about three months to make sure that they were not reinfected. Now, Extragenital sexual behaviors are very prevalent. Both oral sex and anal sex are very common, particularly among the young, but also among the mid-adults, and among both men and women. 
And the fact that these behaviors are very common by, by definition tells you that extra genital STIs are gonna have to be common as well. And that's exactly true. So if you look at the data for extra genital gonorrhea and chlamydia infections, so studies suggest that up to 65% of cases of gonorrhea and 50% of cases of chlamydia among MSM may be missed if genital-only testing were performed. So essentially, the majority of cases of gonorrhea and chlamydia will be missed if you just do urethral or cervical testing. In women, 10% of chlamydia and 31% of gonorrhea infections would have been missed if extra genital testing were not done in an STD clinic population. Remember also that the majority of GC and chlamydia infections in the extra genital areas are asymptomatic. Don't ask about symptoms. And also note that pharyngeal and rectal infections can tr be transmitted to the genital areas of a partner with the appropriate contact. So they are of public health concern. Given that these infections are common and given that they are of a public health concern, it's not surprising that there are recommendations for testing at these extragenital sites. So all persons should be tested for rectal and pharyngeal gonorrhea if they report pharyngeal or rectal exposures, even if they don't have symptoms. The sensitivity of culture to detect extragenital GC is less than 50%, unfortunately. While the sensitivity of molecular tests, nucleic acid amplification tests, is actually greater than 90% for extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia. So the CDC recommends that nucleic acid amplification tests be preferentially used to detect these extragenital infections because they are more sensitive than gonococcal culture. However, if in your setting you cannot get nucleic acid amplification testing for extragenital specimens and you have culture available, by all means, go ahead and use culture to diagnose pharyngeal and rectal infections. Now, some of you are thinking, well, how do we use nucleic acid amplification tests for extragenital infections when they haven't been FDA cleared for that purpose? And the answer is, that's right, they haven't been FDA cleared for that purpose, but you have to remember that testing, you can test a patient and bill for testing even if you don't have FDA clearance, as long as the lab conducts an in-house validation assay that essentially determines whether the test is sensitive and specific. So if they use known positives and known negatives and they find that the test that they want to use is actually sensitive and specific, they can actually conduct this test and bill for it. And indeed, most moderate to high uh, to, um, to very high, um, um, uh, to, to big labs, if you will, are actually conducting nucleic acid amplification testing for extra genital specimens. Towards the end of my talk, I am going to show you some CPT codes and test codes that will hopefully make it easier for you to actually order these tests if you use one of those major laboratories. So it's pretty important that the lab that you use, you should probably give them a call and find out if they actually can provide you with extra genital testing because many labs are now providing you with that. So the efficacy, we're going to move now to the treatment of gonorrhea. The efficacy of antibiotics to treat gonorrhea varies. Ceftriaxone currently at 250 milligrams is one of the drugs that we use to treat active gonorrhea, and it has excellent anogenital and pharyngeal activity. Cefixime, on the other hand, which is now relegated to a second-line agent or an alternate agent, only has 90% activity against pharyngeal gonorrhea. So you have to keep that in mind if you decide to use cefixime to treat pharyngeal gonorrhea. Two grams of azithromycin have, has excellent activity against anogenital and pharyngeal gonorrhea, but you have to remember that, about that two grams of azithromycin has been associated with nausea and vomiting within one hour. In some studies, up to 20% of patients who were given two grams as a single dose of azithromycin vomited in an hour. And so some of the things that you can think about to try and decrease this from occurring, you can try to give your patient a cracker or a small snack about 10 minutes before you give them the two grams of gonorrhea.
that tends to help a little bit with the GI symptoms. Also remember to observe the patient for 30 minutes to an hour to make sure that they don't vomit um, the, uh, the drugs. If you find that the patient has vomited and you find remnants of the pills, you have to treat the patient again. The other useful thing to know is that the sachets, the, the, the azithromycin that you can dilute, that comes as a powder that you can dilute, tends to be better tolerated by patients uh, than the, the caplets, but you can certainly use both, and most patients will do fine. Just remember to observe them for about 30 minutes to an hour to make sure that they didn't vomit the, content, the, the medications that were given. Just briefly, the history of antibiotic resistance, gonorrhea has really been a step ahead of us ever since the introduction of antibiotics. In the 1930s, the sulfonamides were introduced, and literally within months of use, uh, gonorrhea developed resistance. This was followed by the tetracyclines and the penicillins, and we used the penicillins for several decades until the early 80s when uh, the, the, the gonorrhea, the prevalence of penicillin resistance increased significantly, and luckily we had the fluoroquinolones to help us out, and we were still able to use single drug oral therapy to treat gonorrhea using the fluoroquinolones. The fluoroquinolones were used again for a couple of decades, and by 2007, in the United States, the CDC recommended that we no longer use fluoroquinolones, and so we used we moved to the cephalosporins. And most recently, we have moved to dual therapy, and I'll mention that uh, in just the next few slides. Just as a reminder that the first detected ceftriaxone resistant strain was actually detected in Japan in 1983. So we've had ceftriaxone resistance ever since 1983 that was detected. But because we started using fluoroquinolones, the pressure on the, on the bug by using ceftriaxone decreased significantly, so we did not see the emergence of ceftriaxone resistance until more recently when we started using ceftriaxone after losing the fluoroquinolones. So I just want to highlight resistance in the U.S. and locally for two of the classes that we now use to treat gonorrhea. The first class are the macrolides, and GC macrolide resistance has been detected in the United States. There have been several strains with high-level resistance to azithromycin, meaning an MIC greater than 512, that were identified in Hawaii and in California. So if many of you, as many of you know, resistance to the fluoroquinolones in the United States was first detected in Hawaii and California on the West Coast, and then it moved east. And so this is sort of replaying almost like the fluoroquinolone resistance. Um, and uh, several more GISP isolates with reduced susceptibility, where the MIC was greater than two, have been reported in the United States since 2005. Of those, 27 were isolated in 2010. And Dr. Razek will mention in Maryland there have been five cases with reduced susceptibility. But so far, no high-level resistance to macrolides in Maryland. Now let's move to cephalosporins. And Worldwide, there have now been reported cases of treatment failure and cephalosporin resistance in gonorrhea to both the oral cephalosporins and the injectable cephalosporins. So there have now been case reports worldwide of resistance strains to cefixime, cefpodoxime, and other oral cephalosporins, as well as resistance strains to uh, the injectable cephalosporin, in other words, ceftriaxone. In the United States, we have witnessed increasing MICs to the cephalosporins over the last several years, not surprisingly ever since we moved from the fluoroquinolones to the cephalosporins. We have seen increased, resist, uh, increased MICs, um, and we have also detected resistant strains to the oral cephalosporins. To date, up until now, there have not been reports from the United States about resistance strains to the injectable cephalosporins, that is, ceftriaxone. There are strains that are resistant to the oral cephalosporin, cefixime, but not yet to the um, injectable ones in the U.S. The other thing to remember as well is that on the West Coast, they're seeing more 
MIC increases, again, not surprisingly, and the other group that has witnessed an increase in MICs are men who have sex with men. So MSM and West Coast are risk factors, but that doesn't mean that other cities and other areas and other populations aren't affected. Just to mention, in November 2011, the Baltimore GIST program identified the first cephalosporin-resistant strain for our uh, state. The Baltimore strain was resistant to cefixime and cefpodoxime, so it was resistant to the oral cephalosporins, but it was sensitive to the injectable cephalosporin. So we saw our first case of oral cephalosporin resistance in Maryland in November of 2011. Of note, the patient was a young heterosexual male who had not had any travel outside the state. What that tells us is that there are strains that are running around in the city that are oral cephalosporin resistant. Now, I want to highlight one thing. I've been giving you a distinction between resistance to oral cephalosporins and resistance to injectable cephalosporins. And the reason why I've done that is because resistance to cephalosporins in general is usually the result of combined effects of several mutations. So it usually takes several mutations to result in resistance. And so you can have strains that are resistant to the oral cephalosporins, but sensitive to the injectable. You could have the opposite, and you could also have strains that are resistant to both injectable and to the oral cephalosporins. So there's wide variability in terms of resistance to cephalosporins and the strains. And this sort of segues into my next slide, and that is a slide to remind us how important GC culture capacity is. Culture today is really the only reliable method for determining GC antibiotic susceptibility. There are some molecular tests that are used on the research setting, but as of today, none of them can really reliably report culture, phenotypic resistance like culture. And in order to report phenotypic resistance in culture, you have to have live organisms, and as such, you have to do culture. You can't do nucleic acid amplification testing. Maryland, as Dr. Razek will let you know, is one of the few states that has maintained culture capacity, and that's very important. You've also heard me talk about the GISP, or the Gonococcal Isolate Surveillance Program. That's a program that was started by the CDC in the early 80s because they realized that antibiotic resistance was um, shifting quickly in GC. And so they instituted this program where about 30 STD clinics around the country send in 25 isolates every month to the CDC or regional laboratories to test them for gonococcal resistance. In Maryland, Baltimore City is one such site, and we have monthly reports that come back giving us a detailed account of the resistance patterns that we see in Baltimore and in the cities that are part of GISP. Now remember, if your city is not part of GISP, unless you're doing cultures, you have really no idea what the epidemiology of drug resistance is. And that's one of the major reasons why it's so important to maintain culture capacity, particularly in this day and time when GC resistance is a, a huge problem. So what are the treatment recommendations for gonorrhea? The first line or preferred treatment recommendation consists of ceftriaxone 250 milligrams, no longer 125, it's now 250 milligrams, intramuscularly for one dose, and either azithromycin, one gram, one dose, or doxycycline, 100 milligrams, twice a day for seven days. So it's ceftriaxone IM plus either azithromycin or doxycycline. The CDC prefers azithromycin because it's a single dose and the prevalence of resistance strains is far less than resistance to doxycycline, but either one is acceptable. So we are now in the era of dual therapy for gonorrhea. Remember, even if you have a test result for a nucleic acid amplification test that tells you that the patient is infected with gonorrhea but not infected with chlamydia, so even if you know that the patient is not infected with chlamydia, 
you still have to use two drugs to treat gonorrhea. The preferred regimen, there's only one preferred regimen, uh, and the preferred regimen all, is, always has cephalosporins in it. It's cephalosporin plus either a gram of azithromycin or a week's worth of doxycycline. The alternate regimens include cefixime orally, 400 milligrams, plus either azithromycin or doxycycline. Remember, cefixime is only 90% effective at eradicating pharyngeal gonorrhea. And remember now that cefixime is an alternate agent for gonorrhea. And the other alternate recommended agent, and that's the only thing you can use when somebody has an allergy to cephalosporins. The only thing you can use is two grams single dose of azithromycin. So the alternate agents are cefixime plus either azithromycin or doxycycline, or if you have somebody who's allergic to, to the cephalosporins, you can only use azithromycin two grams single dose. The other thing to remember too, is that if you're using a first-line regimen, you treat the patient, you don't have to worry about doing anything else other than bringing the patient back in three months for rescreening or retesting. Once you treat them, if their symptoms go away, there's nothing else you need to do if you use a first-line preferred regimen. If you use any other regimen to treat gonorrhea, so if you use cefixime plus azithro or doxycycline, or if you use azithromycin single two gram dose, you have to do a test of cure in a week's time. Even if the patient is feeling better, you have to do a test of cure in one week's time, and then you have to bring them back in three months to do the regular rescreening or retesting. So the use of an alternate agent to treat gonorrhea now requires that you do a test of cure one week after treatment, even if the patient is feeling better. The test of cure consists of either a culture-based test, which is preferred, because if it comes back positive, you can automatically obtain susceptibility, antibiotic susceptibility testing. But if you want to do a test of cure, you can also do nucleic acid amplification testing. And you can do a test of cure, if you're using culture, you can do a test of cure as early as three days after treatment. If you're using a nucleic acid amplification test, you can do a test of cure as early as seven days after treatment. Now, I know many of you have learned that nucleic acid amplification tests can stay positive for up to two weeks after treatment. But there have been studies that have shown that the vast majority of patients who are treated for gonorrhea, that their nucleic acid amplification tests become negative within that first week. So you can do a test of cure using a nucleic acid amplification test one week after treatment. And again, culture, you can do it any time between three to 10 days. The CDC recommends a week after treatment as a test of cure instead of two weeks, because usually it's easier to bring a patient back in a week. Um, and as such, um, it is probably worthwhile trying to do it within that week. So what should you do if you suspect that the patient has a treatment failure with cefixime-based regimen or a single-dose single 2-gram azithromycin regimen? And what you need to do is do a test of cure. And what you want to do is preferentially obtain a culture. Get a culture and submit that culture for antimicrobial susceptibility testing. If you did a test of cure using nucleic acid amplification tests, and those nucleic acid amplification tests come back positive, you then have to send culture so that you can do susceptibility testing. That's the reason why when we tell you do a test of cure and use a culture preferentially, it is actually easier to do.
Remember again, if you have a patient who gets tested and has a resistant organism, the treatment now becomes ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams IM times one, and azithromycin, but in this case, it's not one gram, it's two grams of azithromycin, orally as a single dose. Again, you have to do a test of cure, and remember that you have to evaluate the sex partners from the preceding 60 days with culture from all exposed sites and treat them for this resistant bug. In other words, you treat them with ceftriaxone plus two grams single dose oral azithromycin. And remember to ask your laboratory to retain the isolate so you can do further testing if necessary. So that's what you need to do if you have a patient that has failure with an alternate regimen. If you have a failure with ceftriaxone-based regimen, you need to do cultures, and you have to get all the sites that were exposed, and you have to order antimicrobial susceptibility testing. What do you do to treat? Well, you consult an ID specialist, or you can call the STD HIV Prevention Training Center or the CDC for treatment advice, which will be based on what we know about drug resistance in your community. And make sure you can also contact the CDC and report this through the local or, uh, or state health department within 24 hours of diagnosis. And remember, once you treat a treatment failure, once you retreat them, you have to bring them again back in a week for a test of cure. It's really important. Same thing with the sex partners. You have to go after their sex partners, and you have to treat them with the same regimen that you use to treat the index patient. So whatever regimen you decide to use to treat the index patient, you're going to have to use to treat the sex partner. If you suspect treatment failure, again, assure treatment for both patient and sex partner. In Maryland, your local health department can help assure that your sex partners of these patients get treated. For these resistant cases, the health department will go out and try to find these sex partners and bring them in to get treatment. And so this brings me to a very important point. It's the law. You have to report all gonococcal infections and treatment information to your local or state health official. All of those cases of gonorrhea, the clinicians have to report them. You should not rely on the lab to report positive cases. If you have a patient that's diagnosed with gonorrhea, whether it's resistant or not resistant, you have to report it to your local health department in addition to the type of treatment that you gave. The two links below take you to the Baltimore City Health Department where there's a form that you can fill out and to also DHMH where you can find forms to fill out and report to your health department. So the cephalosporin resistant case classification there are clinical criteria and laboratory criteria. The clinical criteria, if the patient had laboratory confirmed Neisseria gonorrhea infection and the patient received CDC recommended cephalosporin based antimicrobial regimen as treatment and the patient subsequently had a positive Neisseria gonorrhea test result and the patient did not engage in sexual activity after treatment. Remember, the majority of patients who come in after they're treated and say, hey, I have symptoms again, the vast majority are reinfections rather than treatment failure. They got this infection because they had sex with a partner that was not treated. That's why it's so important to treat their partners. So get a history, ask them if they've had sex in the interim between treatment and these symptoms. If they assure you that they have not had sexual exposures, then at that point you should certainly consider the possibility of drug-resistant gonorrhea, and you should approach that patient the same way that we discussed in the previous slides. That's another reason why the test of cure is pref preferentially done one week after treatment instead of two weeks, because one week after treatment is less likely to be a reinfection than two weeks after treatment. So the test of cure preferentially is done at one week. 
The laboratory criteria for cephalosporin resistant cases, of course, uh, is the demonstration of isolates of Neisseria gonorrhea that have an MIC greater than 0.25 mics per mil for cefixime or 0.125 for ceftriaxone. Again, I want to mention this important point. The difference between test of cure and screening, rescreening. Test of cure is done three to seven days after treating a patient who received an alternate agent for gonorrhea or who has laboratory evidence of a resistant strain. It's done three to seven days after treatment. Rescreening is done three months after treatment, and what you're looking at is reinfection with rescreening, not treatment failure necessarily. So it's reinfection for rescreening. All patients should be rescreened three months later. Test of cure, only patients who have persistent symptoms or patients who got an alternate treatment regimen for gonorrhea should receive a test of cure. And again, the goal of the test of cure is to detect treatment failure. If you do a test of cure and the organism comes back susceptible to the, or to the agents that you used, most likely then the patient was reinfected and it had nothing to do with, with a resistance as a cause of that failure. Expedited partner therapy. At this time, Baltimore City Health Department is providing expedited partner therapy. And what that means is patients who are diagnosed with either gonorrhea or chlamydia are given a small bag to take to their partners to treat their partners. Currently at this time, Baltimore City uh, Health Department is the only place that's doing it in Maryland, but EPT may be expanded beyond BCHD in the future. And so, the problem with EPT is that EPT, what we use to treat gonorrhea, is cefixime since it's an oral regimen. And since now cefixime is an alternate agent, this has put expedited partner therapy, has made it more difficult for us to use it for gonorrhea. If a partner, a heterosexual partner of a patient cannot be linked to evaluation and treatment in a timely fashion, in other words, if you can't bring a partner in to be tested and treated at the physician's office or at the health department, then using expedited partner therapy with cefixime and azithromycin is still considered okay to treat the partners. So for now, expedited partner therapy is still okay if you can't bring in a patient to be tested and treated. In the future, that might change as the MICs to cefixime continue to increase and resistance becomes more widespread. So what are we going to do in the future? And the antimicrobial options are getting harder and harder. For example, if you have a patient now who's allergic to cephalosporins, you, you can only use two grams of azithromycin to treat their GC. If you have a woman who comes in with pelvic inflammatory disease, the only oral option that's recommended as a first-line as a first-line therapy is ceftriaxone-based with doxycycline plus or minus metronidazole. If a patient has resistant, if the patient cannot tolerate cephalosporins, there are currently no first-line recommended agents to treat pelvic inflammatory disease. And so if you have a patient who you suspect has PID, you either have to admit them or you have to call a local ID expert or your local health department for help in choosing an oral regimen that's suitable. And again, that regimen will depend on where you are and the antimicrobial resistance pattern in your community. So it's gotten really much harder to treat these infections. And I'd like to remind you of one thing. Penicillin resistance does not mean cephalosporin resistance. There is a cross-reactivity of about 15%. So if a patient has a true penicillin resist, uh, allergy, uh, if a patient has true penicillin allergy, I should say, then their likelihood of having a true cephalosporin anaphylactic allergy is about 15%. The majority of patients will not have a cephalosporin allergy. And so when you ask about penicillin allergy to your patients, 
ask them whether they've ever taken a cephalosporin. Ask them if they've taken Keflex. Ask them if they've ever taken ceftriaxone before. If they say yes, you can go ahead and use cephalosporins. They're penicillin allergic, but they're not cephalosporin allergic. In the future, dual or more therapy for GC is probably going to be the norm. And some of the agents that are being looked at once we can't use cephalosporins include IM gentamicin and the possibility of IM carbapenems. So there, right now, a, a single dose oral option for GC in the near future is highly unlikely. This slide is, as promised, the CPT codes and the laboratory test codes. Hopefully it'll make it easy. If you use one of the two large labs, it'll help you with the test codes, and you can use the CPT codes to check for gonorrhea culture, gonorrhea nucleic acid amplification tests of the genital tract, of the rectum, of the pharynx, and a combination of both gonorrhea and chlamydia for rectum and the pharynx. So these, uh, this is meant for you as an aid to help you order these tests and ask about these tests at your local labs. And finally, a lot of people are concerned about injectable ceftriaxone because many clinician offices don't have it at hand. Remember that injectable ceftriaxone, the, the vial comes as a powder, and these vials are, have different, um, uh, they can come as 250 milligrams, 500 milligrams, one gram, and two grams. 250 milligram single dose vials are routinely available. When they're in the powder form, they can be stored at room temperature. You don't need to refrigerate the vials. So you can keep them at room temperature. They usually last anywhere between one year to two years on the shelf, but make sure you check with the manufacturer. And you can dilute them. And once you dilute them, and what we use normally is 1% lidocaine to dilute because it tends to decrease the sting when it's injected into a large muscle. So we dilute it with... 1% lidocaine, follow the instructions on the bottle to know exactly how much to use. But once it's diluted, either use it immediately or you can put it in the refrigerator for up to 72 hours if you don't use it. So if you order a multi-dose pack and you only use two doses, you can keep it in the refrigerator once diluted for up to 72 hours. Check the packet insert because there are multiple manufacturers out there and each one varies slightly. But for the most part, if it's not diluted, you don't need to refrigerate. The cost is anywhere between $5 to $12 for each 250 milligrams dose, depending on what, where you're ordering from, the amount that you're ordering, and whether you have special pricing. I thank you very much, and now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Razek for the second part of this talk. We will take questions again at the end of Dr. Razek's talk. Please don't forget to submit your questions by email. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dr. Ranam, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, sometimes uh, it's very difficult to uh, come and present after an excellent presentation, so uh, I ha this is more challenging uh, for me at this point. Uh, uh, so there is no uh, relevant financial disclosures, and uh, we've been talking about the superbug. This is the organism uh, associated with uh, uh, gonorrhea. It's uh, uh, an organism... Uh, uh, microbiologically defined as a gram-negative diplococci. This is a slide showing intracellular uh, bacteria within the uh, white blood cells. This is the bacteria that causes gonorrhea. Uh, this is the organism uh, that's been associated with this sexually transmitted disease. It's one of the, the oldest uh, recorded diseases known to man. Uh, the organism has been uh, 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 discovered or found or uh, 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 clearly uh, identified by Nicer in 1879, and it took three years after that for a few other individuals to cultivate and recover the bacteria. Uh, again, uh, this Nicera gonorrhea, the organism, uh, is not considered part of the uh, uh, human normal flora, and the isolation of this organism as such is always considered to be of significance clinically. Uh, 
Um, and uh, the organism is uh, an exclusive human pathogen, which means that it is uh, only uh, associated with the human infections. Uh, the organism is fastidious and environmentally sensitive pathogen. The bacteria, in order for us uh, to do a good job in controlling the disease and be able to recover the organism, we have to start right. And starting right meaning to collect the proper specimens and get them to the laboratory appropriately so that the organism is still alive. And because of this, uh, the nature of this organism is environmentally sensitive to desiccation to extreme temperatures, it is uh, uh, very important for us to be aware of the proper condition of collection and transportation. And uh, uh, I can tell you that the ideal and best way to uh, recover the organism is to use Dacron or Rayon swabs to collect patient specimens uh, uh, and if possible to immediately inoculate on a selective unexpired media. And I say unexpired media because the selective media we use to uh, recover the organism has uh, several antimicrobial agents to suppress the normal flora present from the sites that these specimens are collected. And if the media is uh, expired, not only we are violating the CLIA's uh, federal laws and regulations by doing testing on expired media, but we are ha we're getting it, uh, the, the media chance for these antibiotics to go wrong and they are not going to do what they are intended to do to suppress normal flora. As such, a result might be uh, unreliable. Uh, obviously, the organism uh, needed to be incubated uh, at 35 to 37 degrees, the human body temperature, under elevated CO2, and uh, uh, transported uh, to the laboratory uh, as soon as, as possible. So uh, this is, again, uh, uh, emphasizing the fact that uh, a proper way, a proper collection way uh, in order for us to recover the organism. So uh, in the uh, figure uh, on the left is uh, the first step where when you collect the specimen, you just uh, uh, you do the uh, yeast uh, tricking. And then at the tip of the swab, you can uh, do this uh, cross streaking so that we get uh, an isolated colonist in the laboratory. Remember, Dr. Ghanem has uh, emphasized several times on the uh, importance of recovering the isolate. And if, we're, if we don't do it right from the beginning, then we may have a problem at the end. So again, this is uh, the proper way of starting uh, uh, the specimen streaking on the selective media. And if you do this alone, uh, and you send us to the laboratory, and we have seen that uh, frequently, this is an actual plate uh, of how we get the organism streaked. So as you can see, this is very uh, tough sometimes to see what type of organisms we are dealing with. Uh, and if you, if you do the first step, which is the uh, uh, Z streaking and the cross streaking, uh, which is really the ideal way of preparing the plate media that you collected the patient swab from. Uh, this is an ideal plate. As you can see, you have uh, isolated colonies that we can work from. We can isolate it. We can uh, do the biochemical uh, testing that we are supposed to be doing. And we can do the most important thing, which is the antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Uh, so antimicrobial susceptibility testing, uh, uh, again, is uh, as Dr. Ghanem mentioned, is uh, offered in uh, some private laboratories. I know uh, they are uh, doing that, and if they are not, they probably have, they can have some arrangements to send them to where they can be tested. Obviously, our state public health laboratory is among the uh, uh, few laboratories in the nation, uh, state laboratories, who still have the capacity to culture and do uh, susceptibility testing for this organism. Uh, this is, uh, so uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing, there are uh, several ways of doing this. Uh, obviously, this is a, a picture of an actual plate where you have, uh, this is the disc diffusion, uh, where discs actually uh, containing known amounts of uh, the uh, antibiotics are placed on a surface of an agar plate that has been inoculated with the uh, organism. And then susceptible organisms, you can see, they show a zone of inhibition around the disc, and these zones are measured, and they are applied against the Clinical Laboratory Standard Institute guidelines that are published every year 
to reflect whether this organism is susceptible or resistant based on that zone of inhibition. And the other way of doing is what's called the E-test. And this is basically uh, a strip that has antibiotics, uh, a known gradient of the antimicrobial agent. And you uh, just drop or replace that strip on an agar uh, uh, media that has been inoculated. And uh, the antimicrobial actually is released into the agar media from, uh, uh, from the strip. And you can see this type of uh, susceptibility profile inhibition around the disc because this is the lowest concentration here goes to the highest concentration. The beauty about this ETS is that it gives you an MIC value. An MIC is a minimum inhibitory concentration where it is the lowest concentration of the antibiotic where the organism is inhibited. It's not growing in, in vitro in the laboratory. Um, so the global picture of drug resistance, and this is again a snapshot of what is really uh, happening out there. there is, uh, it's very difficult to uh, collect all the literature uh, on what is uh, going on out there, but uh, this is uh, 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 a recent study in the Sexually Transmitted Disease Journal uh, where uh, co data collected on close to 11,000 isolates from uh, uh, several uh, countries in Latin America, and uh, you can see that ciprofloxacin resistance uh, significantly increased from 2% in 2000, in 2000 to almost 30% in 2009. Uh, azithromycin resistance increased from 6 to 23%. So this is really, uh, th there is really a problem out there. The second study uh, from the European uh, member uh, states uh, showed that uh, in 2009, 5% of isolates had decreased susceptibility to cefexim and um, an upward uh, trend in the minimum, uh, in the MIC of ciprofloxacin and a high prevalence of resistance to ciprofloxacin and azithromycin. Ciprofloxacin, 63% in, the, in, the, in this particular study. Azithromycin has been shown to be around 13%. Uh, the global picture in the, uh, a study in, from the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy recently, uh, uh, the emergence of high-level azithromycin resistant in uh, England and Wales. Uh, in 2009, a study showed a major shift in six isolates recovered from patients attending a sexually transmitted uh, uh, clinic, an infection clinic with azithromycin of MICs more than 256, uh, 256 uh, which is really a high-resistant uh, organism. Um, in uh, Sweden, uh, again, the proportion of Neisseria gonorrhea isolates with decreased susceptibility and resistance to cefexim and ciprofloxacin have increased over the years. And uh, so the story of uh, drug resistance is, is, uh, uh, is really getting all over, and uh, uh, monitoring drug resistance uh, is, is of extreme importance. Uh, the picture in the United States is, is not uh, better uh, from what's globally uh, uh, you can see here uh, the data collected from the CDC, penicillin, tetracycline, ciprofloxacin. In 2009, uh, penicillin went from uh, 3.8 to 3.5, uh, ranging in that uh, tetracycline, 7.9 to 9.4. Ciprofloxacin, this is the national picture. Uh, cefexime and cefetriaxone, an average of uh, close to 6,000 isolates been tested annually between two, the year 2000 and 2010. You can see here that the percentage of isolates with an MIC of more than 0.25 micrograms per ml of cefexime increased from 0.2% in 2000 to 1.4% in 2010. So we, we clearly are uh, going towards uh, an issue where uh, the cephalosporins uh, can be uh, problematic to use as treatment options. A percentage of isolates uh, with uh, for cefetriaxone uh, increased from 0.1% to, uh, this is a typo, to 0.3% uh, uh, in 2010. So clearly you are seeing an increase in this uh, drug resistance. Maryland, uh, again in our state, uh, the uh, penis, we, so far we have not seen any uh, 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 documented resistance for uh, uh, uh in our state, but clearly you can see that the uh, tetracycline, uh, the ciprofloxacin is, is up there uh, 
uh, equivalent or even worse than the national picture. Uh, so far, we have uh, a, a total of five isolates that we tested in our laboratory that has uh, an MIC of azithromycin uh, more than one microgram per ml. Now, the, uh, the Clinical Laboratory Standard in Institute, which is the uh, uh, laboratory institution that really documents and regulates the susceptibility testing uh, interpretations have no clear guidelines for azithromycin. The CDC, uh, though, have some uh, recommendations. Any isolate for azithromycin that has an MIC of uh, more than two micrograms is considered to be of a critical value. Uh, in our case, those isolates were in the range between uh, four to eight micrograms, so they are not really highly resistant, but they are uh, what's called reduced susceptibility to uh, azithromycin. Um, so uh, the alarming elevated MICs to cephalosporins uh, led the uh, CDC in 2011 uh, to recommend that state and local health departments should promote maintenance of laboratory capacity to culture Neisseria gonorrhea to allow antimicrobial susceptibility of isolates for cephalosporin resistance. And we do uh, test in our laboratory again we uh, do the disc diffusion as well as, well as the e-test uh, on those cephalosporins uh, to monitor creeping in MICs. Anytime we see an increased or elevated MICs, we know that there is uh, a problem uh, uh, going on. Uh, so the CDCs have these messages uh, that has been published uh, in August of 2012. These messages to the laboratories uh, that the capacity of laboratories in the United States uh, to isolate Neisseria gonorrhea by culture is declining rapidly due to the fact that most uh, healthcare providers are using molecular uh, testing uh, uh, methods. So it is essential that the CDC is saying that culture capacity of Neisseria gonorrhea be maintained to monitor antimicrobial resistance trends and determine susceptibility to guide therapy and to monitor any creeps in uh, increase in anti in the MIC values for the cephalosporins. Laboratories must maintain culture capacity or develop partners with laboratories that can perform culture. Though, so this is the message from CDC to the laboratory community, and their message to the healthcare providers is to help control uh, gonorrhea in the United States. Uh, they must maintain the ability to collect specimens for culture and be knowledgeable of laboratories to which they can send specimens for culture. Again, as I, Dr. Ghanem mentioned several times, that this is important, especially when you have uh, a patient who's suspected of having uh, uh, treatment uh, failure. Uh, and the uh, CDC's message to the healthcare system in general that uh, they should, uh, healthcare systems and health departments must support access to culture. Now, what happens if we ignore the CDC's recommendations? Um, if not, then we may uh, go from resistant Neisseria gonorrhea and multidrug resistant Neisseria gonorrhea to these very dangerous uh, terminologies associated extensively drug resistant Neisseria gonorrhea, pan or totally drug-resistant uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, or even we may get to the point where we are, uh, ha we have a situation, we have uh, an untreatable Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, this, uh, uh, this is not really unheard of in infectious diseases and microbiology, because we are already there in some of the other gram-negative organisms that are carbapenem resistance. So we, we, we really need to pay attention to uh, what the CDC has say uh, in their most recent recommendations. And, uh, uh, I'm going to leave you with this uh, fascinating quote that uh, uh, was published uh, uh, recently that it is uh, probably only a matter of time before extensively drug-resistant uh, uh, gonorrhea strains become widespread and treat treatment failures, uh, particularly for pharyngeal gonorrhea, become commonplace. Actions is therefore urgently needed at local and international levels to combat the problem. We advise that government agencies take this threat seriously and provide urgently needed funds for increased research, surveillance activities, and vaccine development. This is really uh, an, an important message that I'm going to leave you with. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rezek and Dr. Ghanem. A uh, very, very informative uh, overview of where things are these days with gonorrhea and gonorrhea treatment. Um, and I'd also like to say that we're very fortunate here in Maryland to have
uh, such current and uh, up-to-date experts available to us, uh, both with Dr. Rezek with the uh, State Public Health Lab, which is still doing culture, so you know, still very much in the loop with that and on the front line, and with Dr. Ghanem, uh, who is also serves as a consultant to the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the development of the 2010 STD treatment guidelines and is a member of the editorial board of the journal Sexually Transmitted Infections. So it's good to know we're all in the loop here and, and very current and up to date. Um, if we have any questions here in the audience or in the auditorium. Okay, we have one question. Yes, uh, how much multi-drug resistance um, is found in your lab? You just talked about, I guess, single drug in the tables, but uh, how much multi-drug resistance is there and to what? Yeah, we have, we have not really looked into that, but that's something uh, we can always go back and look at the uh, multi-drug resistance uh, in, in, in the, from the previous years. So that's a good uh, question. The one organism that was uh, suffixium resistant in Baltimore City happened to be sensitive to ceftriaxone and sensitive to the fluoroquinolones. But overseas, they've detected several strains that actually had multi and th that were essentially extensively drug resistant. So uh, it really is variable. And that's also the reason why molecular tests to detect mutations uh, that essentially predict uh, resistance have sort of been um, uh, lacking mainly because there's so many different mutations that are there and different permutations lead to different phenotypic expressions. So it's kind of a, uh, it would be nice to be able to do it molecularly. Do we have other questions here in the audience? Okay, here's an audience, a, a question that came in uh, via email. Uh, first, it starts with a statement. I can tell you that the emergency department is treating gonorrhea hundreds of times per month with no confirmed testing, retesting, or partner therapy. There are many impl implications of this in, uh, for resistance. Are there emergency department specific recommendations such as should we still treat and, ref should we still treat and refer out for follow-up or should we refer out for both treatment and follow-up or other recommendations for the emergency department? So that's a great question. I would say that if you're in an emergency department, um, if you're gonna treat, you should be able to test. Um, ideally, if you wanted to test, you certainly can use nucleic acid amplification tests, which, is, which are highly sensitive. Um, and you could certainly uh, use culture if nucleic acid amplification tests are not available for you to use. The thing to remember is, if you're in an emergency department and you suspect gonorrhea, go ahead and use the primary recommended agent. So in other words, go ahead and use ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams IM, a plus either azithromycin or doxycycline. Remember, azithromycin is preferred. Um, and if you're using that recommended first-line uh, strategy, ask the patient that, or tell the patient that if they get better, that's great. They don't need to do anything except come back in about three months, go to their physician in about three months, or go to the local health department to get rescreened to make sure that they were not reinfected. If the patient continues to have symptoms despite the treatment that was given, at that point, you would recommend that they go again to their primary care physician uh, to get uh, tested, a test of cure, if you will, uh, to uh, perform a culture to make sure that the patient doesn't have uh, drug resistant um, infection. At this time, if you're using a primary uh, first line drug um, drugs to treat gonorrhea, you probably don't have to worry much about follow up. On the other hand, if you're using uh, second line agents to treat this, uh, this infection, then you have to tell the patient uh, to go for a test of cure uh, to be done in the next three to 10 days. And they would have to go either to a local health department uh, STD clinic or go to their primary care physician. Uh, partner notification is mandatory. So um, if you're if you're testing, if you're treating empirically, it's going to be, and you're not doing any testing, 
of course, it's really hard to do, uh, to, to essentially notify the local health department or the state health department. So that's why it's kind of important to go ahead and test if you're gonna be treating. Uh, if you're testing and uh, the tests come back positive, each emergency department should probably have a system in place whereby reportable infections can be automatically reported to the local health department and the treatment that was given can also be reported. So I think the answer is try to use Test all patients if you're going to actually treat them, um, and tr uh, try to use the first line agents to treat it because then you really don't have to worry too much about tests of cure and follow up. On the other hand, if you can't use a primary uh, first line agent, go ahead and use an alternate agent and refer them to the local health department for uh, tests of cure or for their primary to their primary care physician for a test of cure. Thank you. Uh, we have some more questions that came in by email. Uh, here's one. If the patient will be treated for presumed gonorrhea and it is, is appropriate for the first-line regimen, is it necessary to culture oral and rectal areas? So um, it, the, the reason why you're culturing, uh, so let's say you had a patient who came in who had a test result that was positive for gonorrhea. Um, and you're gonna treat them with a first-line agent, then you can go ahead and treat using a first-line agent and not so much worry about it. Most of the situations arise when a patient comes in and wants essentially to be screened for an infection. We don't know what they have and we want to screen them. And screening extra genital sites uh, would help you, would help increase the sensitivity of detecting an infection that may, may not be in the genital sites. So if you already know that a patient is infected with gonorrhea in the urethra, and you're going to use first-line agent, ceftriaxone plus azithromycin or doxycycline, you don't necessarily have to look elsewhere. But if you're going to use a second-line agent like cefixim, which we know has only 90% effective uh, activity against pharyngeal strains, then at that point I would recommend doing pharyngeal, uh, uh, either gnats preferably or culture, to document the presence or absence of the infection there, that way you can actually follow the patient up when they come back. Because if they, if you detect pharyngeal infection in the uh, pharyngeal infection at the time of treatment, when they come back to do a test of cure, you're going to test both the urethra and the pharynx to make sure that they cleared the infection. Thank you. Uh, another question: If a patient reports alternate treatment was given for gonorrhea gonorrhea recently, but on clinical interview, it is thought the patient is a candidate for first-line treatment. Should the patient be treated immediately with the first-line regimen? I probably wouldn't do that. If a patient comes in and says, you know, a, a week ago I was treated using two grams of azithromycin, I would probably go ahead and do a test of cure. Uh, and if the patient's test of cure comes back, negative, then at that point there's no reason uh, to retreat them. And of course, you certainly want to make sure that their partners uh, were tested and treated appropriately. Okay, and another question. If a symptomatic patient with high suspicion for STI states that they were treated recently for another medical condition with another antibiotic like acne um, or Lyme disease, um, doxycycline, um, or tooth abscess, clindamycin or pharyngitis, Keflex, et cetera, is NAT testing reliable or should you go straight to empiric first-line treatment for presumed GC? Yeah, so recent antibiotic use um, is always an issue. Um, and um, NATs, certainly culture may come back uh, negative um, if, you're, you, if they, they used an agent or they took an agent that had uh, anti-gonococcal activity. Um, NATs testing, depending on the time that the antibiotics were taken, may or may not be positive. And so the question is excellent. The answer would be if you suspected in somebody who is who potentially got some antibiotics, go ahead and test for it, but also go ahead and treat immediately empirically for it. That's probably the only way to be sure that the patient received appropriate therapy. Uh, so if the, the, the test comes back negative, you won't know whether it's a false negative because they got the antibiotic or because the patient was never treated, but um, uh, it's still worthwhile testing because if the test comes back positive and the patient continues to have symptoms after you treat them, you could potentially go on and follow that patient uh, 
appropriately. So it's worthwhile testing, but I would certainly treat whether you test or not. We have a couple more. Is the NAT one week after treatment adequate for test of cure for chlamydia as well? So um, <laughs> uh, the, 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 what we've normally been taught and what we've read in a lot of the studies is that um, you, know, you have to wait two weeks for both gonorrhea and chlamydia. The study by Laura Bachman that I referenced in my slide on test of cure is the study that the CDC relied upon for gonorrhea to say that at one week, uh, the likelihood of having a false positive uh, is very low for gonorrhea. Uh, the test of cure for, um, uh, for chlamydia may come back as positive at that time. Um, uh, but again, uh, since we don't see a lot of drug resistance to chlamydia, the most likely reason for a positive test at one week is most likely a, uh, a, a false positive, uh, i.e., the, that is, the, the nucleic acids are still there. Remember, there's no reason to do a test of cure for chlamydia, and so if you're doing a test of cure at one week, you probably just want to focus on doing a test of cure for gonorrhea. Also remember that a test of cure, uh, if you're doing combined gonorrhea and chlamydia, may not be covered by the insurance because there are no recommendations to do test, test of cure for chlamydia. So the answer is don't do a test of cure for chlamydia. Do a test of cure for gonorrhea at one week. Thank you. And our final email question here is, uh, doesn't the guideline to treat males with urethral discharge empirically for gonorrhea increase the potential for drug resistance? So the answer is uh, potentially yes. Um, and that's why the guidelines, uh, that's why they try it, uh, to get you to actually know what you're treating. Uh, before you actually empirically treat. Now, having said that, if you're using a recommended uh, treatment regimen, uh, these treatment regimens are, you know, are short duration, they're dual therapy, um, the, the probability of developing resistance is on the low side. But of course, every time you use antibiotics unnecessarily, you increase the potential for development of drug resistance, uh, not only of the age of the organism that you're using to treat, the, the antibiotics to treat, but also of other organisms that, be, that may be found in the gastrointestinal tract, in the pharyngeal tract, et cetera. So the answer is if you don't need to use an antibiotic, don't use it. The other answer is use it for the shortest period of time that you can. And the third answer is if you suspect and there's no way to treat for STDs because it's a public health issue, go ahead and treat empirically. I mean, for STDs, it's different. It's a public health issue, um, and the, 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 the probability of transmission is high if they're symptomatic uh, and you don't treat them and you send them home while you're waiting for test results to come back. And so for STDs, other, uh, unlike other certain infections, um, it's probably worthwhile to, uh, to treat uh, if you can't test for it. Great, thank you. And I think that uh, wraps up our questions today. And I'll give back to Janie Gordon for a moment here. Thank you. Ms. Janie. Hello. Thank you all for participating. And I just want to remind everyone to join us on October 17th for our regularly scheduled public health practice grand rounds on making health reform happen, how Maryland is implementing the Affordable Health Care Act. Thank you.